All right. Today is Thursday, July 15th, and this is a recap for the stock market activities today. Before we start, thank you for all of you who inquired regarding my dog. She's doing a little better, but we're not out of the woods yet. With that being said, what about the market? We are still witnessing and investigating the bond market mystery. What's going on with the bond market? Why are yields continue to collapse when we know that inflation continues to rise significantly higher? We are experiencing the hottest inflation since the 1970s. One would expect that yields, interest rates will rise higher as a response, but this time around, every time we get hot inflation data, yields actually go down. So what's going on here? We have investigated many different possibilities from the technicals, the transitory argument, which is the dumbest one, by the way, the delta argument, the tapering argument, the stagflation argument. And so far, it is anybody's guess why the bond market is reacting this way. In this video, I want to discuss the tapering argument and the delta argument because these two arguments are gaining a lot of ground. I also want to use the opportunity to throw more cold water on the bullshit argument of transitory inflation and I will show you the facts. But let's start with the tapering argument. When we compare the inflation from the 1970s to the inflation we're seeing right now in 2021, the reaction from the US dollar bond yields and gold is pretty much 180 a total different reaction in today's market than the 1970s why what is the difference because we don't have any other case of inflation in modern history at least since the 1950s that we can pin and look at as a guideline beside the case of the 1970s and therefore economists and market observers are looking at the 1970s case as a guideline assuming that inflation this time around will follow the same playbook but perhaps this is a mistake and the reason is the existence of quantitative easing this time around which did not exist back in the 1970s the reaction to contain inflation in the 1970s was to increase interest rates and make it harder for money to circulate in the economy but the response to tame inflation this time around will not start by increasing interest rates instead it will start by tapering and tapering reduces the amount of currency circulating in the system because the fed has been injecting over 120 billion dollars of liquidity in the system every single month when the fed decides to taper assets purchasing programs in response to rising inflation that will reduce the amount of dollars in the system and therefore pushing the value of the u.s dollar higher so the existence of tapering makes the playbook this time around quite different and distorted this is at least according to the tapering argument in addition when the fed decides to taper to respond to higher inflation well guess what this market this economy has been riding high on the drug provided by the federal reserve aka the co Kane, aka quantitative easing valuations across the board whether we're talking about the equities market the housing market they're all distorted for a reason they've been riding the wave of liquidity for over 10 years when the fed decides to taper to respond to rising inflation well the fed will take that cocaine out of the system and the economy markets will respond by suffering a withdrawal syndrome and therefore bond yields go down because this economy and this stock market has been riding high on the wave of liquidity you trim that liquidity to respond to higher inflation well guess what the outlook of economic growth shrinks and this is what the bond market is trying to convey to us by dropping yields every time we get news regarding higher inflation likewise in the 70s the value of gold appreciated handsomely during the great inflation of the 1970s but this time around gold is not performing at all gold is underperforming even though we're getting some of the hottest inflation numbers in at least four decades this also could be distorted due to the tapering effect meaning that the first stage of inflation in the 
2020s will perhaps be the exact opposite of the 1970s. The dollar goes higher, yields go down, gold goes down, and then in the later stages of inflation, where we're done with tapering and we're moving on to raising interest rates, perhaps at that point, the playbook will be matching the playbook from the 1970s. But for now, the tapering impact is distorting markets, activities, and actions in response to inflation. This is at least according to this tapering argument. Now, let's address the bullshit argument of transitory, because in the morning, we got more inflation data. We received the Empire State Manufacturing Index, and it came out as the highest reading in record. Once again, the highest reading in record. Matter of fact, prices received surged higher, while prices paid continue to be elevated. Likewise, the Philly Manufacturing Index actually cooled down slightly, but it remains at elevated levels, and prices received continue to rise higher. Therefore, the evidence right in front of us, we got the CPI, the PPI, and now we got the Empire State and Philly Manufacturing Indices all pointing to higher inflation. No transitory, whatever that means. Likewise, we got more evidence in the morning that inflation continues to rise higher. Import prices have risen by 1%. Now, 1% might not sound impressive to you, but this is the first time in over seven years when import prices read this high. Once again, inflation continues to rise higher, at least according to the facts and the data, not the conspiracy theories, not the hope and faith from the Fed. And unlike the transitory argument, the Delta argument is gaining some ground. For example, the game for the New York Yankees this evening was cancelled because certain players were tested positive for the COVID-19 virus, even though they were vaccinated. And we are assuming that this is the Delta variant. And perhaps this is the big one. After the bell, we got news from L.A. County reinstating the mask mandate, meaning that if you live in L.A. County, you're going to have to wear masks indoors once again. And this is not good for the market, by the way. Yes, it's just one county, L.A. County, and the rest are not going to follow, yada, yada, yada. But it is yet another sign that we have certain pockets in this country and in other countries that are reverting back to lockdown mode. So perhaps the bond market is dropping due to Delta concerns. This argument is gaining a lot of ground. But here are the main events of the day. We have the testimony from Chairman Jerome Powell, part number two. And this one is a lot better than yesterday because this is the Senate and Jerome Powell testified in person. And let's just say that he received tougher questions than yesterday. And this time around, unlike yesterday, you can hear in his tone the frustration and the fact that he is feeling the heat because inflation has become the talk of the town. And judging from Powell's behavior and testimony today, you can see that the tapering prospects are becoming extremely close. The man is feeling the heat because you watch the nightly news these days and they're talking about inflation. Everybody's thinking about it. Everybody's talking about it. Everybody's making decisions based upon it. Yesterday, Powell said, we're way off in our tapering expectations. And this is what he said today. Why is the Fed maintaining its emergency monetary policy posture right now? And why do I understand that it may continue well into 2023? So where we are is uh, we're watching the evolution of the economy. We, we're noting that uh, there's still an elevated level of unemployment. We note that inflation is well above target, uh, and we've discussed that. Um, and we've said that we would begin to reduce our asset purchases when uh, we feel that the economy has achieved substantial further progress measured from last December. So we're in active consideration of that now. We had a full meeting last, uh, last June, last month, uh, to discuss that. We've got another meeting coming up in two weeks. So we'll be making that assessment. And, and as we assess the progress of the economy toward that goal, we will begin to reduce our asset purchases. We've set a separate test for raising interest rates, which is a higher test. And uh, 
So that's that's how we're thinking about about this today. And the argument is, why not start by tapering MBS purchases? They're not needed. Forty billion dollars a month for a market that is already too hot. But once again, the Fed is occupied by brainless zombies. And look no further than New York Fed Williams, because he's even beating the stupidity and the ignorance of Powell. Williams says. Why the FUD and the hate against our MBS purchasing programs? Did you know that treasury buying programs also boost the market, the housing market that is, as if he's defending the practice of buying MBS? mortgage-backed securities assets. And you might say, oh, look at that, Williams. He's admitting that the cocaine operation is boosting prices in the housing market. Uh-uh. Hold that thought. Here are the details. This guy has no shame at all. He says the cocaine operation boosts the housing market by contributing to lower housing costs. Are you kidding me? Really? Buying bonds, mortgage-backed securities to the tune of $120 billion every month is contributing to make housing more affordable? And this guy is on some fantastic drugs to think this way. Flooding the market with unneeded liquidity actually contributes to lower housing prices. And he said that with a straight face. And here is another Fed zombie from Chicago, Evans. And remember Powell yesterday said, we gotta have hope and we gotta hold hands and pray and have faith that inflation will be transitory, even though he lacks quote unquote certainty. Now we have Mr. Evans saying that we need quote unquote patience on top of hope, faith, and prayers for inflation to be transitory. And here is the exchange with uh, Senator Toomey. He asked the question, that the House of Representatives should have asked yesterday. Let me, let me turn to housing prices a bit. Um, the Case-Shiller Home Price Index showed home, housing prices in, across the U.S. as a whole increased in May by more than 15 percent from the previous year, and that wasn't a base effect. There was no big decline in, the, in May of last year. 15 percent clearly is making housing less affordable, more out of reach for more people. So the number of voices within the Fed seem to be increasingly concerned about this. The St. Louis Fed President James Bullard said just this week that he is, quote, a little bit concerned that we're feeding into an incipient housing bubble, end quote. Dallas Fed President Robert Kaplan said that the Fed should begin tapering to begin offsetting, quote, some of these excesses and imbalances, end quote. The Boston Fed President Eric Rosengren raised alarms that the Fed's mortgage-backed security purchases may be contributing to the current boom in real estate prices citing the potential financial stability impl implications. I, I guess, you know, I've been clear for a long time. I've been very skeptical about the uh, ongoing mortgage-backed purchases. Are you at all concerned about the unintended consequences that are associated with $40 billion worth of mortgage-backed security purchases that continue month after month? So housing prices are going up, as you mentioned, around 15 percent. This is a very high rate of increase. A number of factors are contributing. Monetary policy is, is certainly one of those factors. There are also other factors. People have uh, very strong balance sheets, so they're able to make down payments. There are also supply factors that are constraining the supply, at least temporarily. So, um, you know, our best, my best thinking is that the difference between Treasury purchases and MBS purchases for this purpose is not a large one. Probably MBS purchases are somewhat, uh, somewhat more supportive of housing. That's not their intent, but that may be the effect. Really, the larger point is that monetary policy is supporting this, and, and that is something. That's a discussion we're going to be having uh, as uh, on an ongoing basis. We, we we talked about some of these things at our last meeting. We'll talk about it at the next meeting in uh, in a couple of weeks. Notice that he is feeling the heat. And he is also talking about a couple of weeks. We're going to talk about it again. Rest assured, stop bitching and moaning. We're going to talk about it in a couple of weeks. What is he talking about? I believe that the Fed will start announcing tapering in the Jackson Hall meeting. This is what he's talking about. But perhaps the best exchange of the day happened between Chairman Powell and Senator Warren from Boston. But I want to talk about a couple in particular. To prevent taxpayer bailouts, banks are required to have living wills. This means that banks must be able to show every single year how they could be shut down without wrecking the entire economy. In 2019, you changed the rules so that the 13 banks 
with $250 billion to $700 billion in assets could submit full living wills only once every six years instead of every year. So that test is now weaker. Chair Powell, has the Fed done anything over the past four years to make living will requirements stronger? To make living will requirements? We've done a lot of things to strengthen regulation and capital, but I yeah, but I, I think on living wills. Living I'm wills. just no. I, I mean, okay. I explain what we. So let's move to another regulation, the Volcker Rule. Okay, pay attention here. He is scribbling. He is getting agitated, and watch his uh, facial expressions. This is good. The rule that works sort of like Glass-Steagall light to separate commercial banking from Wall Street risk-taking. In 2019, you exempted more short-term trading holdings from the rules so banks could take on a little more risk. Now, that weakened the rule. Then in 2020, you eased up the rules to let banks invest more of their assets in high-risk private equity and hedge funds. So the Volcker rule got weaker again. So let me ask, Mr. Chairman, during the past four years, has the Fed done anything to make the Volcker rule stronger and limit risky trading for the largest banks? I think by, by clarifying it, we made it more effective at what it's supposed to do, which is just what you said. Well, I, I have to say it's whether or not you did anything to make it stronger, not just whether or not you made it uh, clearer, it's whether or not you made it stronger or harder for banks to engage in speculative trading. So I, I'm taking it that the answer here is no. I've highlighted two examples of weakening regulations, but there are a whole lot more. Uh, reducing capital requirements, easing liquidity requirements, shrinking margin requirements, scaling back on supervision, weakening the stress test. It's a, it's a long list, and I realize that you think these are good changes, but I'm trying to look at this from a regulatory perspective. Is the chairman of the Federal Reserve making banking rules stronger or weaker? So tell me, Mr. Chairman, is there a big rule change that I missed? Can you name a change that strengthened the rules and made the actual rules tougher? Well, let me say we, we did not weaken capital requirements for the largest banks, and we, I actively resisted any move in that direction. And, in fact, the stress capital buffer, which we implemented uh, quite recently after years of consideration, raises capital standards so, for the largest banks. By the way, stress tests, they're really bound by the stress test. We, re we maintain the very high stringency of the stress tests through this period. So, but what I was asking about anything tougher. Look, what I'm looking for is that the Fed's record over the past four years, I see one move after another to weaken regulation over Wall Street banks. And that worries me. There's no doubt that the banks are stronger today than they were when they crashed the economy in 2008. But that's the wrong standard. <laughs> you saw his reaction when she said, Banks crashed the economy. That really hurt his feelings. Let's see it again. There's no doubt that the banks are stronger today than they were when they crashed the economy in 2008, but that's the wrong standard. And of course, he got offended because she accused his bosses, the banksters, of crashing the economy in the last financial crisis. But this is who Jerome works for. This is who he seeks to please. Not you and I, the people, but banks, hedge funds, and other financial institutions. And of course, the Fed's apologists, their dogs in the media, attacked these senators, describing them as grouchy for asking legitimate questions or holding Jerome's feet to fire as gently as they could and as they did while they questioned him. And once again, the Fed, Jerome, can say whatever they want about a transitory inflation. As I showed you in last night's video, corporate America, they're not going to wait for inflation to become transitory. They're going to raise prices anyways assuming that inflation will not be transitory and those price hikes will be permanent because corporations are not going to reduce their prices out of the goodness of their hearts if inflation turns out to be transitory when their margins increased and benefited from price hikes and the demand did not go away consumers continue to buy whether the company reduces packages a la shrinkflation 
or whether they raise prices as is. And we continue to hear from corporate earnings. Pretty much every single corporate earnings call, they mention and they talk about inflation and how inflation is impacting their top and bottom lines. When will costs be shifted to the end customers in forms of price hikes? And here we have another CEO from Raytheon addressing the transitory bullshit. If I may, you and I were talking before we got started and, and we were talking about transitory. What is transitory? Is that a word that CEOs can get their head around? You know, I, I asked that question you know, several weeks ago when I first heard uh, Chairman Powell talk about the effect of transitory price increases. And I, my concern there is what is really transitory? Because if you start to see inflation in labor, that's not transitory because labor costs don't go down. They may go up more slowly, but what we're seeing right now is a lot of, or a lot of cost pressure uh, at the very low end of the, the labor scale, and I don't think that goes away. Now, will that translate into higher prices across all of the, the economic spectrum? I don't know. But we're also we're seeing inflation in commodities mm -hmm. in some of the raw materials as well. It's impacting what you guys are doing. Absolutely, every day. And so I, I worry the transitory, especially with all of these deficits that we you know, two, we're talking two and a half trillion dollar deficits. We're pumping a lot of money into the economy. People are flush with cash. They're going to spend it. That's going to drive prices up. Are we going to get off of that drug soon? I don't think so. And here it is drug. The man described it as drug. This is a market. This is an economy that is hooked on a drug. And this drug is the Fed's cocaine, aka free cash, free liquidity, money printed out of thin air with no stop in sight. And for all of you transitory geniuses, oh, you see, inflation is transitory. Where is inflation? Is it over here? Is it over there? And this is why bond yields are dropping. Trust the process, bro. Okay, here's the process. You want to talk about transitory? Let's talk about supply and demand. Demand skyrocketed higher during the pandemic or supply was shut down and could not keep up with the demand and therefore we got inflation the argument for the transitory corner is that yes demand is high way too high but now that we're reopening the supply chain will catch up with demand and close the gap and therefore inflation is transitory what you are willingly or unwillingly ignoring is the fact that demand hasn't stopped growing higher. Demand continues to rise higher significantly with no stop in sight at all. I know a lot of you are pissed off about the 300 bucks in unemployment benefits that the deadbeats are getting every month. Ah, you see, we're not filling all of these jobs, 9 million jobs, uh, because the government is giving the bums an extra 300 bucks a month to sit at home. And I told you there are a lot of other things beside the 300. And you will see that once the 300 bucks expire, the unemployment rate will remain high and jobs openings will remain high because there are other factors, more important factors than the 300 bucks keeping people at home. But if you thought that was bad, hold on to your pants before they fall down because now, our deadbeats can cash in another 300 bucks a month on top in child tax credits. If you got a baby, you got a child, all the way to 17 years old, you can claim them and get an extra 300 bucks a month courtesy of Uncle Joe Biden. So now you got 600, but wait, there is more. We're talking about 300 bucks per child. Oh, what was that? You got five kids? Well, that's 1,500 bucks a month that you're going to get on top of unemployment benefits. Hey, fools, you think demand will stop anytime soon when the government is making it rain, baby, all over the economy. Cocaine all over, monetary, fiscal, doesn't matter. We got your back, print, baby, print. So everybody, yay, let's have babies. You're going to look at your children differently this time around. You're going to look at them with the dollar signs. You get 300, he gets 300, you get 300. As if we need more kids, by the way. Let's encourage people who are already poor and cannot even provide for themselves right now to go ahead and have babies. Unlimited amount of babies. Go ahead. Because you're going to get 300 bucks per month per baby. Remember back in the day when your girlfriend or your wife came up to you and said, Honey, sit down. I got some news for you. I'm pregnant. You look down. You smile. You ask her, Oh, really? Wow. What a good news. Wow. I'm so happy for us. 
But the inner conversation with yourself actually goes, oh shit, now I got my life destroyed forever. Not under the Biden administration, baby. Now when she delivers the news for you that she's pregnant, you celebrate by going to the casino. And you guys know I'm smart with money. And I always look for opportunities. Investing opportunities in every situation. So I am seeing a trade here from this news. How about we start shorting condoms put options on condoms to zero zero we're gonna short over a hundred percent of the float of condoms by the way i have three dogs can i claim them as children mr biden come on i'll vote for you give me some free cash and i'll vote for you next time ladies and gentlemen say goodbye say a prayer for that matter for the republican party because you're not gonna see any republican politician get elected to office again Cry me a river. What about fiscal responsibility? What about the future of the country? Who cares? Who cares? Papa Jerome is printing. Uncle Joe is printing. They are spreading the yayo all over the economy. And you know what? I like the free cash party. Fiscal responsibility. Dad, what are you talking about, you clowns? So there it is, folks. You buy put options on condoms and call options on Biden and the Democrats. And by the way, I'm not against handing people free cash. I am supportive of the 300 bucks a month in unemployment benefits, and I am supporting the child tax credits, the extra 300 bucks a month per child. So long as Wall Street continues to receive $120 billion in liquidity due to quote-unquote emergency accommodations. Start tapering for Wall Street, and then we'll talk about tapering for the deadbeats. Anyhow, I got carried away here and spent a lot of time. But you know what? I got a market to cover. And here we go. The Dow Industrial Average closing in the green by 53.79 points or a gain of 0.15%. The Nasdaq closing in the red down 101.82 points or a decline of 0.70%. The S&P 500 in the downside closing in the red with 14.27 points or a loss of 0.33%. What about the sector's performance? We have a defensive theme here because leading the pack at number one and capturing the gold medal, utilities, and at number two for the silver, REITs, and number three for the bronze, financials. Notice that the dividend paying sectors of the market are leading. Meanwhile, the laggards are led by energy, technology, and communication services. This is yet again that the Delta explanation for the bond market is gaining a lot of ground these days. And we continue to find evidence when we dig in the details. For example, the performance of crude oil and the energy sector today, indicating that Delta fears are legitimate. Perhaps we're going to have a bigger problem with Delta than we have originally thought. What about the internals of the market? The NYSE, 34% advancing versus 64% declining. The NASDAQ, 32% advancing versus 65% declining. Once again, awful. And extremely weak. What about futures? We have a down day for crude oil futures and perhaps the start of many red days to come as Delta fears continue to gain ground. The WTI and crude oil Brent both down by about 2% today. What about softs? The collapse of lumber continues. Lumber down by the tune of over 7% today. Massive massive decline and of course the question is now that yields are down we're about to see mortgage rates also going down will this reignite the housing mania and we see more stampeding to buy homes and if that is the case the lumber futures will recover we will see a bounce as we see a reigniting of the housing mania however if consumers already moved on to the rental market then perhaps the housing mania will not be resumed as we see mortgage rates go down. If that is the case, then we have not seen the bottom in lumber yet. And by the way, lumber is also reacting to the prospects of tapering because stage number one of tapering is cutting back mortgage-backed securities assets purchasing, meaning that the housing market and lumber are the first casualties from popping this bubble. Back to the futures market, specifically softs. Coca futures were trading down along with cotton were also trading slightly to the downside. Meanwhile, gains for OJ, sugar, and coffee. OJ rising by about 4% 
today. What about metals? Muted activities for gold, silver. Meanwhile, gains of about 1% for platinum and copper. The only loser in metals futures, palladium, dropping with about 3%. What about meats? Flat across the board. Lean hogs, feeder, live cattle futures, all closing on the flat line. What about grains? Soybeans muted. Meanwhile, declines of about 1.5% for soybean meal, while soybean oil futures trading higher by about 1.5%. Likewise, gains for wheat, rough rice, oats, and canola futures. Wheat rising by about 2.7% today. Besides soybean meal, which dropped by about 1.5%, we have corn futures also dropping by about 1%. Moving on to the options market, the big casino, the hottest table per usual, Apollonia, with about 2.5 million contracts traded today, about 71.5% of those were calls. At number 2, AMC, rebounding higher with a volume of about 1 million contracts, about 54% of those were calls. At number 3, Tesla, the souffle, with about 700,000 contracts, about 50 2% of those were calls. What about unusual trades in the market today? Starting with the ticker EWZ. This is for the Brazilian ETF, and they are making bullish bets, at least according to this trade. I abandoned the South African market due to the unrest, so I am eyeing another overseas market, perhaps the EWZ, the Brazilian market, we'll see. In this case, they're buying the 42.5 calls expiration date August 6, with the expectations that the EWZ will rise by over 7% by then, and they paid about 25 cents a piece to enter the trade. All in all, spending about $750 thousand dollars on this trade what about the ticker cgc canopy wheat here we have a bullish trade for canopy they are buying the 22 and a half calls expiration date august 20th with the expectations that the name will rise by about 11 percent or more by the expiration date and they paid about 85 cents a piece to enter this trade all in all spending about 1.7 million dollars on this trade alone what about the trade for the ticker nflx this is for netflix they bought the 580 calls expiration date july 23rd with the expectations that the name will rise by over seven percent by then and they paid about six and a half bucks a piece to enter this trade, all in all, spending about $1.6 million. What about the trade for the ticker ARKK for ARK Invest? Mama Kathy, not doing so hot so. She is worried about deflation, believe it or not. And Mama Kathy's RKK continues to slip down. And somebody's bidding for more pain to come. They bought the 110 puts expiration date July 30th with the expectations that the name will drop by over 5% by then. They paid about two bucks a piece to enter this trade. All in all, spending about half a million dollars. Lastly, what about the ticker NOVA, Sanova? They're making a bearish bet here by buying the 30 puts expiration date August 20th, expecting the name to drop by over 10% by then. And they paid about a buck and a half a piece to enter this trade. All in all, spending about $375,000. What about the heat map analysis? What's not working? How about technology, specifically semiconductors? We got results from TSM, Taiwan. The market were not, was not impressed. Taking down chip names altogether. Energy is not working. Healthcare specifically AZN, AstraZeneca. Why is this important? This is yet another evidence that the market is worried about Delta. It is still thinking about Delta. And it goes, countries that are vaccinated via the AstraZeneca vaccine, not the mRNA vaccines from Pfizer or Moderna, they're under threat from the Delta variant. Apparently, the AstraZeneca vaccine loses efficacy more than Pfizer or Moderna vaccines when fighting Delta. Now, what was working in the market today? How about regional banks? We got earnings from U.S. Bank Corp., USB, and again, they were excellent. On par with Wells Fargo, J.P. Morgan, Goldman Sachs, 
Financials reported excellent earnings this week. We also have the Chinese names, Alibaba, Pindudu, etc. Bouncing in the green today due to activities in the options market. These are becoming options marketplace. Dividend paying stocks and sectors of the market were also perhaps leading the market. Not just gaining, but leading the market. Whether we're talking about utilities, REITs, and even defensives. The likes of Procter & Gamble, Kroger, Mondelez, dividend paying stocks as yields continue to collapse. Moving on to charts, starting with the 30 minutes chart of the SPY. Yesterday, I identified the 438 level as resistance. We did not do a video regarding charts last night, but I did in my own charts. And the reason is we have yet another rejection from the same level, which makes it a resistance level, 438. And this time around, we have a double top formation in the hierarchy of topping formations. Double tops are supreme. And the reason is the confirmation comes within the double top the double rejection you have your confirmation within the signal unlike bear flags reverse hammers gaps and craps double tops are extremely reliable the market opened gapping down all the way to the support of 434 struggling to hold on slipping back and forth from support and resistance Yet, at the end of the day, the chart managed to close above 434, and therefore, the damage is still minimal. We have to zoom out to the daily chart of the continuous contract for the SPY. We have any confirmation of the damage from a candlestick pattern. Not a lot of damage. No reliable reversal signals yet from a candlestick pattern. What about the momentum indicators? The RSI, negative divergence, and we have an imminent crossing to the downside in the MACD indicator. So, no confirmation, however, looking very likely. The reversal is looking very likely here. What about the Qs? The Nasdaq, 30 minutes chart, and we can see the double top even more evident and more symmetric than the SPY. And the level we stopped at was 365 and a half. Double rejection, and then going down all the way to retest the support of 363. The level doesn't hold, the SPY goes down, seeking support in the next support zone of about 360 and a half. It found some support for now, not too strong, but holding in the 30 minutes chart. Zooming out to the daily chart of the continuous contract on the NASDAQ. We have a sign of a reversal from the candlestick pattern, a beginning stage of a reversal because you've erased a few days worth of activities in a single day. And therefore, we have a reversal in the Nasdaq's futures, unlike the SPY's futures, where we did not have a candlestick confirmation. And you can see even the momentum indicators for the Nasdaq futures are more negative than the momentum indicators for the SPY's futures. The crossing is more eminent here for the MACD indicator and the RSI, the negative divergence is even more evident. So both markets are weakening significantly, but we don't have that confirmation of a reversal yet. The hunters and the early riders, they start shorting the indices right now. They got enough signals, enough indicators to initiate a short trade. But conservative traders wait for a confirmation. What about the IWM small caps? What a beating breaking the support of 218 this is a massive beat down for the iwm going back for days and of course technical analysts use the iwm as a leading indicator now we have a flush down in the iwm if that is the leading indicator then we're about to see a flush down in the nasdaq and the spy the assumption is that at some point shorts have to cover shorts will have to book profits from shorting the IWM at say 230, 229, some of these shorts will have to cover or should cover to book profits and that should act as support for a bounce in the IWM. When will that happen? I have no clue. But usually Fridays, option expiration, we will see some of these contracts closing and perhaps a bounce for the IWM. WM. And here is a daily chart of the RUT. We are now trading below 2,264, indicating that the bears have gained advantage. But the line in the sand remains 2,100. That has not been violated yet, but once it is violated, it is a signal for a massive short 
trade. But until then, we are still within consolidation range. What about the Dixie? What's going on here? Daily chart zigzagging between gains and losses, but maintaining the trading range of 92 as support and 93 as resistance. The momentum indicators are weakening the RSI, the MACD. But again, it is the fight between technicals and fundamentals. The technicals suggest that the US dollar should go down, but the fundamentals leading for a sooner tapering by the Fed in indicate that the US dollar should be trading higher. So we're going to see this tug of war between the technicals and fundamentals. And here's gold closing at the Fibonacci retracement level, which should act as resistance. We're talking about 1,830, 1,840 in or around these numbers. Many technical analysts pointed out the reverse head and shoulder formation in the chart of gold, the GLD, the GDX, and I agree, the overall trend remains bullish for gold, specifically if yields continue to drop down. Remember, yields rising higher, indicating higher inflation, this is at least the traditional way of looking at it, at least so far this year. When this phenomena happened, we saw gold trading down as if it is not a reliable inflation hedge. But again, it's tapering, distorting the axis in these movements. This is what I am really curious to find out. What about the big eel? Yields popping all the way to the resistance zone and immediately reversing 180, losing all the gains from the pop right after the CPI. What are we looking at right now? Once again, 1.28%. 1.28 basis points this must hold for support not a penny down because if you are bullish on yields you're looking for a higher low to form and then a slow grind higher to challenge the descending trend line what about the tlt weekly chart once again 180 we were down in the red in the beginning of the week and now look at it trading in the green once again and the destination remains 149 150 i believe if we get to 150 a lot of shorts by default will start to scramble to cover 150 is a round number a psychological number trading above 150 for the tlt will start to change the game what about the vix four hours chart the macd indicator is starting a new move to create green impressions once again a new positive move higher in the macd indicator in every crossing the last few weeks the vix registered double digit gains minimum and the last one was for gains of about 40 three percent will this pop be even bigger leading the vix to cross and close above 20 for the week we will see for now you combine the information the crossing in the macd for the vix the topping formations in the spy the double top the negative divergence in the rsi when you combine the picture we are getting eminently close to a correction if not a massive one but here's the stock that single-handedly held the market and it is so far softening the blow and preventing any correction from happening apple the big kahuna we have weakness we don't have a reversal signal yet we have weakness a reversal signal happens when the support of 145 is violated until then we only have weakness and remember i don't believe that we will see mass liquidation event in apple prior to earnings so we might drop two three percent in the name here but all in all if there is a crash if there is a severe correction in apple it will happen due to earnings a drop of 10 percent or more that will be a reaction to earnings i doubt it will happen before that what about tesla the souffle 30 minutes chart getting rejected again from 679 and going all the way down violating the support of 657 massive weakness for the souffle here but is there any hope yes there is how about closing above 657 for the week meaning by tomorrow 657 the chart has to close above this number by the end of the week what about tulips i'm looking at the macd indicator starting to weaken starting to show red impressions on the histogram not solid ones not reliable ones yet but the weakness is becoming more evident 30,000 will become another battle. For now, BTC bulls are holding and putting up a good fight to defend and hold 30,000. The problem is, how long can they hold? They need offense to back off the tsunami. What is offense? 
more blood, more whales buying BTC, more announcements from corporate America about normalizing BTC. None of this is happening right now, and therefore, we are seeing significant weakness in tulips. What about AMC apes? We talked about 32 last night, the gap, and that was closed, and the name bounced from this gap, not once, not twice, but three times. And the question is, how big the short covering will be? Because a lot of shorts made a lot of money shorting AMC. The likelihood is, they don't want to hold on these shorts for a long time. They want to book profit quickly. The assumption is, we will see, and we already started to see, some profit taking by shorts. The question is, will it continue toward the end of the week? I believe so. However, I am not so confident that 32 will hold for support in the long term, I wanted to share more shots with you, more tickers, but in the interest of time, we'll do that in tomorrow's video. For now, we're moving on to the conclusion of this video. What do we have on the economic calendar tomorrow? We have retail sales, but this is a lagging indicator. The expectations are that retail sales will drop, and this is expected because the stimulus impact is gone, pretty much. And the majority, the bulk of purchasing and shopping already happened via stimulus. No need to shop here. This is not an indicator that inflation or growth in the economy or the spending mania is getting weaker. I know the Fed's apologists, the transitory camp, will start jerking off right away the moment retail sales come out down month over month. But again, this is a lagging indicator and the spending already took place. Retail sales is transitory. Inflation is not. Lastly, the market is still in a dilemma. Last year, we have shifted from technology and growth to reopening and inflationary stocks. And now, we are on the lookout for the next trend. Where is the next trade? Here's the problem. What you're looking at is a heat map for the one-year gains for the S&P 500. These are gains going back one year ago. Pretty much every single stock in the market is lighting up green, meaning gains. This is or has been the easiest market ever. You place your chips anywhere on the roulette table and you're going to hit big. Regardless, unless you bought intel and at and t but beside that if you placed your bets anywhere in the market you scored big everybody's a genius in a bull market specifically a hyper bubble mania market but in the search for the new trade you look at this heat map and there is nowhere to go everything is over bloated everything is overheated everything is crazy and the best of the gains are behind us this is a seller's market not a buyer's market so could the next trade be cash taking profits booking gains and if that is the case then we are about to see a significant correction in the stock market so hold on to your diapers hold on to your kleenex or toilet paper whatever floats your boat doesn't matter to me i don't shed tears but anyways buckle up we're looking at a rough patch to come anyways this is all i got for you tonight and i will talk to you again tomorrow if you found the information presented in this video helpful please subscribe press the like button the notification button and follow me on social media.